This morning, I have a very important question for you. Are you ready? Here it is. Do you love Toronto? Wow. (laughs) This message is for you today. Okay. (laughs) Now, what I don't mean is do you love its beautiful buildings, whether they're old or new, amazing architecture, concert halls, theaters, museums, thousands of excellent restaurants, parks, waterfront. As amazing as all those things are, that's not what I'm asking you this morning. Do you love the people of Toronto? When you see masses of people packed into a subway car, like I had just recently, where people are so close to you that they're jostling you, or when you're driving and you see just this sea of red taillights in front of you in gridlock, or you're walking down the Danforth, having a stroll, and people are just flying past you with their white earbuds in their ears, trying to get to where they have to go, Or maybe you see a family that's dressed completely different from you and you've never heard the language that they're speaking. You've never heard it before. Or even when you're nervous, walking down and you see a group of gangsters walk right past you. That's what I'm talking about. Do you love the people of Toronto? Do you see them as God sees them? as his precious creation, many of them heading to a Christless eternity completely lost without him. This week I read about a couple who loves their city as God does. Their names are Bill and Mary Crispin. They've devoted almost 50 years of their lives to their city where God's placed them the inner city of Philadelphia. And Bill has become a leader in reaching the inner city for Christ. His efforts have actually resulted in many new church plants and countless lost people found by Jesus. And even though he's now officially retired, he still is taking all of his energy and researching on how best to partner the local churches with inner city neighborhood ministries. Now, you may never have heard of Bill before, but you may have heard of someone that he's greatly influenced, Dr. Tim Keller, inner city pastor in New York City, another pastor who has an amazing heart for his city. Tim Keller said Bill Crispin challenged a popular but theologically incorrect statement. And here he was referencing those who go out into the countryside, and when they get out there, and they see the nature, they say this. Now this is God's country. And Bill smiles, and this is how he responds. The country is where there is more plants than people. And the city is where there's more people than plants. And since God loves people much more than he loves plants, he loves the city more than he does the country. That statement made me sit up and take notice because I've actually been guilty of saying that myself. And Keller concludes this. He says, The apex of creation is the making of male and female human beings in the likeness of God, Genesis 1, 26 and 27. And therefore cities which are filled with people are absolutely crammed full of what God considers the most beautiful sight in his creation. Cities have more image of God per square inch than anywhere else, and so we must not idealize the country as somehow a more spiritual place than the city. Interesting. And so I ask you again, do you love Toronto, the city where God has placed you? God loves cities. He has love 
He has compassion and he has patience towards those he has created in his image. But to be honest, we as his servants aren't always as compassionate towards the lost. Some believers have lived here so long that the crowd actually, the crowds around them become invisible. Just part of the fabric around them. Yes, they see them as people, but not lost people that God loves and who he's longing to rescue. And so they've become apathetic. They become indifferent. That's one group of people. Another group of people are actually filled with great disdain for the density and the diversity of the city. It's a negative attitude. They stick to themselves. Even longing for the day that God will judge wickedness and pride. And can I just tell you that both attitudes are wrong. Both ignore God's heart. What God expects of his servants. And we know that because of today's wake-up call from God's prophet Jonah. And God's message for us is clear. Respond with compassion towards the lost. But before we turn to Jonah, would you just pause and pray with me? Father, as we turn to you in eager expectation, help your word come alive to us this morning. We are open, Lord, to your Holy Spirit as he applies your holy word to our hearts. And help us not just be listeners of your word, but help us obey what you are calling us to do. In Jesus' name, amen. Take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Jonah. If you didn't bring your Bible this morning, I encourage you to grab one of the blue ones in the rack in front of you. Page 654 will take you to the book of Jonah. And as you're turning there, let me just set the stage for you. Jonah was God's prophet in the northern kingdom of Israel. And God was calling him to preach against Nineveh, the capital city of Assyria. Where was Nineveh? You can see it there on the screen. Map from my Bible there. 750 years before Christ, this capital city was actually infamous for its wickedness. Nineveh, one of the main cities of Assyria, was known actually for its cruelty. And some people call, some scholars call Nineveh the most cruel capital city to ever exist. Its rulers were known throughout their history for violence and for terror and for torture killing their conquered peoples. Will Durant, in part one of the story of civilization, records how the Assyrians invented the torture of skinning people alive. And although in Jonah's time, Israel had not yet been conquered by the Assyrians, they were already having to pay tribute, or there's like a, a tax towards the Assyrians, protection money, Wanting, I'm sure, its judgment. Wanting its complete destruction, including Jonah. Well, I trust you found Jonah. And listen to the first verse. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because of its wickedness has come up before me. By the way, God calls Nineveh the great city, that great city three times in the book of Jonah. Verse 2, but Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa where he found a ship bound for that port. And after paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. Now, chapter one of this very stunning story starts off with Jonah trying to run away from God, as if that were possible. 
Tarshish was the last known city to those living in, Jerus- in, uh, in Israel. It was the last known city. It, was, it would be like us saying, I'm getting out of here. I'm going all the way to Timbuktu. It was the last known place, the, the farthest place that he could think of. And so he's not merely a reluctant prophet like some of the prophets were, nor is he just a disgruntled prophet. He is downright rebellious and disobedient. And yet God is continually pursuing him, as we'll see. Now, Jonah wasn't always disobedient. 2 Kings chapter 14, verse 25, explains that Jonah was a prophet during the reign of King Jeroboam II in the northern kingdom of Israel. And he was an unrighteous king, Jeroboam II, who actually expanded the borders of Israel during his 41-year reign. The only reason, by the way, why he was able to do that is because Assyria had come in and either taken captive or wiped out all the people in that region. Jonah was the prophet, according to 2 Kings 14, who God told that this expansion was going to take place. And so Jonah would have been very aware of the violence and the wickedness of the Assyrians. Once an obedient prophet, but no longer. In fact, Jonah is deliberately disobedient. And yet God and his mercy, he doesn't allow Jonah to get away with it. Listen in as the drama unfolds. Verse 4. Then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea, and such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. And all the sailors were afraid, and each cried out to his own God. And they threw the cargo into the sea to lighten the ship. But Jonah had gone below deck, where he lay down and fell into a deep sleep. And the captain went to him and said, How can you sleep? Get up and call on your God. Maybe he will take notice of us and we will not perish. And then the sailors said to each other, Come, let us cast lots to find out who is responsible for this calamity. And they cast lots and the lot fell on Jonah. So they asked him, Tell us, who is responsible for making all this trouble for us? What did you do? Where did you come from? What is your country? From what people are you? And he answered, I am a Hebrew, and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the land. And this terrified them, and they asked, what have you done? They knew he was running away from the Lord, because he had already told them so. The sea was getting rougher and rougher, and so they asked him, what should we do to you to make the sea calm down for us? Pick me up and throw me into the sea, he replied, and it will become calm. I know that it is my fault that this great storm has come upon you. Instead, the men did their best to row back to land, but they could not, for the sea grew even wilder than before. And then they cried to the Lord, Oh, Lord, please do not let us die for taking this man's life. Do not hold us accountable for killing an innocent man, for you, O Lord, have done as you pleased. And then they took Jonah, and they threw him overboard, and the raging sea grew calm. At this, the men greatly feared the Lord, the word there is Yahweh, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows to him. But the Lord provided a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was inside the fish three days and three nights. This is the word of God. Now, here is the first lesson that God has given us from the book of Jonah that we must heed. And it's this God is constantly modeling his compassion to his servants. Now, do you notice the irony in this first chapter? God is using pagan sailors to teach Jonah about his compassion. In fact, everything in this first chapter contrasts Jonah's lack of compassion. Old Testament scholar Joyce Baldwin points this out. The great wind and the violent storm is sent by Yahweh, the Almighty God, to get Jonah's attention, just to stop him in his tracks. 
And even the seasoned sailors know that this is not a normal storm. It has a very supernatural element to it. The sailors realize, but Jonah totally misses it. Although he's the cause of the danger, he takes refuge from this storm in complete oblivion. What's gone, what's gone wrong? He's lost communication with God. And you know what? When God's servants deliberately disobey, meaningful prayer goes out the window. Do you see? It's the captain of the ship who doesn't know Jonah's God who exhorts him to pray. And this storm is meant as God's tool to get Jonah's attention, and instead it's gotten the sailor's attention. Jonah would rather die than obey. Yet they're the ones who respond with compassion. They refuse to throw him into the sea, and they just try to row harder and harder to get to shore. But the storm just gets worse, and finally, in desperation, before they toss him into the, the raging sea, they plead with the Lord not to punish them for, for killing him. Now think about that. They have compassion on one man, and Jonah doesn't care about the tens of thousands of people in Nineveh about to perish. It's the sailors who are the ones praying. They're the ones who offer the sacrifice. They're the ones who make vows to the Lord. I was actually thinking about this this week, and I was thinking, you know what? We actually might meet those sailors in heaven. You know why? Because we have the story recorded. See, Jonah was off the scene when they fulfilled their vows to the Lord and offered these sacrifices. And it could be that they, they went back to find out who this real God is. And their story is recorded. You know, God in His compassion still uses His wayward servant to rescue these sailors. But He didn't stop there. He gave Jonah a second chance. Verse 17 says that the Lord provided an Uber pickup. Well, <laughs> actually it was a great fish to rescue him, some would say a whale. That's not what we're debating about today. That part doesn't matter. What matters is that it was God's compassion and mercy upon Jonah. He did not deserve it. You know, today, there are some of us who are a lot more like Jonah than we'd ever care to admit. Jonah said in verse 9, I worship the Lord the God of heaven who made the sea and the land. And you know what? Like Jonah, some people say that they worship the Lord, and yet there's a serious discrepancy between their creed and their deed. And Jesus told us, his servants, to make disciples, not to bury, not to waste our talents, to take the gospel to the lost, and yet some people who claim to know Christ would rather die than rescue the perishing. They've chosen life over death, or death over life, disobedience over obedience. It's tragic. You know, I've actually watched people who say they follow Jesus, they want to see the lost destroyed, annihilated. By the way, that's not a new sentiment. There's a little story in Luke chapter 9 where two of Jesus' closest disciples ask permission to call an airstrike after a little Samaritan village doesn't welcome Jesus. Listen to this. Do you remember this story? Luke 9, 54 to 56. When the disciples James and John saw this, they asked, Lord, do you want us to call fire down from heaven to destroy them? But Jesus turned and rebuked them. And they went to another village. Jesus rebuked them. You know, in the Bible, Jonah actually serves as a foil for Jesus. A stark contrast. In fact, some people would call it an anti-type. You see, Jesus, too, slept in a boat while a supernatural storm threatened to capsize it. Do you remember? And it wasn't because he didn't care. In fact, it was exactly the opposite reason. He was on an obedient mission for his father to seek and to save those who were lost. 
a mission of compassion, a mission of love. In fact, the Gospel of Mark goes on to say just a few chapters later that Jesus saw a large crowd and he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. In fact, right after Jesus calms this storm, he meets one of Scripture's wildest characters, a man society sees as a monster full of demons, and he rescues him. And God desires for us to have his heart, not Jonas. Psalm 145, verse 8 and 9 says, The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. The Lord is good to all. He has compassion on all he has made. And God desires for us to have his compassion, Jesus' compassion, heart of compassion that's displayed all throughout the gospel messages. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Rescuing the perishing, staying alert to those around us who are lost. Well, how do we do that? I read an article by Andrew Porter. He lives in St. John, New Brunswick this week. And it's called Living with Eyes Wide Open. And he writes this. We live in a society where it is normal to stick earbuds in our ears and to keep our heads down with our eyes glued to a screen while people walk right on by. Jesus wants to shake us up out of that self-centered mentality, and he wants to notice the people around us. And then he gives this example of Jesus in John chapter 5 when he is on uh, a journey to Jerusalem for a festival, a great festival. And then as he's walking into the city, he stops at the pool of Bethesda. He notices something. He sees a man that's been sitting there. He's been lame for 35 years. In just a few words, he heals him. And Andrew asks this question, how many of us walk blindly past the lost and the lonely every day because we're too much of a hurry to get where we need to go? And Andrew has learned to ask the Lord this request when he wakes up every morning. Lord, help me to see who I can love and serve today. Now, can you imagine what it would be like if each of us did that? God showed his compassion to the sailors and to Jonah, but you know, he wasn't finished with Jonah yet. And God accomplishes his sovereign purpose despite our disobedience. He is merciful. He continually calls us to repentance. In this case, after Jonah's prayer of thanksgiving, I encourage you to read it this week, chapter 2. At the end of that, verse 10 ends with this, and the Lord commanded the fish and it vomited Jonah onto dry ground. God's mercy and compassion for Jonah and now the Ninevites. Chapter three starts with God for the second time commanding Jonah, go to that great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. And this time Jonah obeys the word of the Lord and the Ninevites listen. And scholars say, scholars say that God and his mercy was already working on the Ninevites to help them be able to listen to Jonah. From history, we know that they had just experienced a famine. They had just experienced a solar eclipse, which they would have seen as a great sign, and a violent rebellion, an uprising. And whatever the reason, they listened to Jonah and they repented. They were a harvest that was ripe. The Ninevites believed God. It says, verse 5, they declared a fast, and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. This was a sign of deep repentance. Even the king, verse 6, which was unheard of, rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in the dust. A sign of great humility. Can you imagine it? His royal decree didn't count on God to spare them. That's, that's very interesting to me. Listen to what he says. He says, let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows? God may yet relent. And with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. This is amazing. This is remarkable that the king would do this. And with repentance... God gave them a reprieve 
for at least another 150 years until another wicked generation rose. But in chapter 4, verse 1, Jonah was greatly displeased and became angry. Listen to verse 2 and 3. Chapter 4, very dramatic, filled with self-pity. And by the way, it's not until this verse in chapter 4 that we find out why he fled Tarshish in the first place. Oh, Lord, is this not what I said when I was still at home? This is why I was so quick to flee to Tarshish. I knew that you're a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, O Lord, take away my life, for it's better for me to die than to live. For the second time, we see a death wish of a disobedient servant. Disobedience leads to death, spiritual death. Now, you see, on one level, Jonah was obedient, but he wasn't compassionate. His heart was not filled with compassion. He still hated the Ninevites. He still wanted them to be destroyed. And even though he understood God's attributes correctly, he thought that those attributes were just reserved for his people, the Israelites, God's ancient people. Not a city like Nineveh. And that brings me to the second part of our lesson today. Outreach without compassion is still disobedience. Sometimes Christians try to evangelize the city out of a sense of duty to God, but in their hearts they're still filled with hostility towards those who are lost. And so they debate and they argue with just this inner rage simmering underneath the surface. And maybe you've met someone like that. Hopefully you're not like that, because God hates that attitude. Listen to God's question in verse 4, but the Lord replied, have you any right to be angry? God's challenging Jonah's sinful attitude, and Jonah, by the way, is in no mood to respond. He refuses to recognize the suggestion that he might be in the wrong. In fact, instead of repenting of his anger and lack of compassion, Jonah just decides, you know what, I'm going to wait around and see what happens. He chooses a vantage point from which to watch the city. He wants to see what's going to happen. He's no hurry to go home. Rather than admitting that he needs a new attitude, he is looking for a change in the city's fortunes. Verse 5, Jonah went out and sat under a place east of the city. He's already gone all the way through the city now onto the other side. And there he made himself a shelter and sat in its shade and waited to see what, go- what would happen to the city. And then the Lord God provided a vine and made it grow up over Jonah to give a shade for his head and to ease his discomfort. And Jonah was very happy about the vine. It's the first time we see Jonah happy with God. He's hot. He's at the risk of a heat stroke. And God, who has not given up on Jonah, has provided him a tall, leafy plant to to come up over him, shade him, relieve his discomfort. And Jonah's interest has switched from the city of Nineveh to now his own well-being. Can I ask a question? Are we ever that fickle? Watching and wishing God's judgment over certain people in our city And then expecting God to bring comfort to us when we're feeling discomfort in any way? Now, I don't think we'd ever admit that out loud. But you know what I've noticed? I've noticed sometimes in our prayers that we act like that. Perhaps more, a little little more refined than Jonah's angry words. But instead of praying for God to have mercy on the lost around us who are perishing, we focus our energy on praying for our own comfort. Maybe our own sore throats, our own sore toes. And yet, God is still merciful to us, desiring that we too learn this lesson, that obedience without compassion is still disobedience. He wanted Jonah to learn that lesson. And Jonah's people, Israel too. You know, Jesus also taught this story, didn't he? 
through the story of the prodigal son, when he talked about the elder brother, Luke 15, do you remember his words? This is the elder brother. Listen, for all these years I've been working like a slave for you and I've never disobeyed your command. But he didn't get it. He didn't have that heart of compassion. And God is constantly teaching his covenant people that obedience without compassion is still disobedience. Again, in the text in Jonah, it said that God and his loving compassion provided. This word keeps showing up in the book of Jonah. God provided. And just as God provided a large fish and a vine, he now provides a worm to chew the plant in a scorching east wind. Still God providing. But at dawn the next day, verse 7, God provided a worm, which chewed the vine so that it withered. And then the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind, and the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. He wanted to die and said, it would be better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, do you have a right to be angry about the vine? I do, he said. I'm angry enough to die. Now, at this point, if we were God, we might have said, all right, Jonah, you just keep asking to die, so you are finished. I've had enough of your disobedience. I've had enough of your stinky attitude. I gave you so many chances to respond to my mercy and my compassion. So you, you're done. Goodbye. But you know, God isn't us. And God has the final say in this chapter, not Jonah. Don't you love it? Verse 10. You've been concerned about this vine, though you did not tend it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and it died overnight. But Nineveh has more than 120,000 people who cannot tell the right hand from their left. And many cattle as well. And here's the final question. Should I not be concerned about that great city? God was pointing out to Jonah that Jonah should have had compassion like he did for the repentant Ninevites. Why? It says they didn't know their right hand from their left. I was greatly challenged about that this week. Someone sent me, someone from the congregation here sent me an email about Barna's latest statistics about Generation Z, the newest generation of young people. And it said in, that st- in those statistics that twice as many of those as previous generations are now atheists. Twice as many in, our, in the young generation. Most of them have never gone to church. Most of them don't know the right hand from the left. And shouldn't we be going after them with compassion? The Ninevites were uninstructed. They were morally naive. They didn't have the truth that Israel had been given. Instead of that making Jonah despise the Ninevites, it should have increased his compassion, God is saying. And then God ironically challenges Jonah that, hey, Jonah, even if you don't have compassion of the people in Nineveh, what about their animals? And the story ends abruptly with that stark question, should I not be concerned about that great city? We don't know if Jonah ever repented of his disobedient attitude. Perhaps, as the story is recorded. But that's not the point. The point is how we, as the reader, responds to this wake-up call. Do we respond with compassion towards the lost in this great city that God loves? Or do we respond in apathy or even vengefulness? You know, it's very interesting. Of all the minor prophets, Jonah is the only one that points to the mission of the New Testament church. Jonah is the only Old Testament prophet that's sent to a pagan city to call it to repentance. Timothy Keller writes this, The book of Jonah foreshadows the centrifugal New Testament mission sending believers out rather than the centripetal Old Testament mission calling non-believers in. 
God's final statement is striking. God calls Jonah to love that pagan city of Nineveh because of its vast number of spiritually blind inhabitants, 120,000 of them. And now think of our city. Estimates today that of our almost 3 million people, that this morning, that two and a half million people will not be in any type of worship service. Any type. So I go back to our first question this morning. Do you love Toronto? I believe that our church will never have the impact in our city that God desires unless we learn to love the city of Toronto, the people of the city of Toronto as God does. This is God's country. Where do we start? Well, we pray. How do we pray? This, I don't know if you remember this, but the first Sunday in January... We prayed this prayer together. Today we're going to pray it together again. I trust that you believe it as you pray. This time we'll have it on the screen. Would you stand and rise with me as we pray this together? Father, please take us deeper into intimacy with Jesus. Grant us humble and repentant hearts and give each one of us at Calvary Church a growing burden for the unreached and a growing compassion for the lost. Father, as we grow in faith and as we abide in Christ, please direct your people at Calvary and to service to make disciples of our friends, family, and neighbors. May each of us be praying for three friends that we desire to see Jesus save. And may those that the Holy Spirit draws to Christ be baptized here this coming year. We long for an increase in new baptized disciples of Christ here at Calvary this coming year. Please give each of us open doors, open hearts, and courage to make disciples wherever we are. Lord Jesus, you told us that the harvest is plentiful and the workers are few. Lord of the harvest, send us more workers for the works you have given us to do. We pray, Father, that you lead us to those you have chosen, that together we may joyfully enter into your harvest and bring the gospel to the unreached, that Jesus Christ may be glorified in all things in his church. Amen.